Good afternoon and welcome to the Law and Crime Network. I'm your host, Vincent Hill. Of course, we do not have any live trials today, but we will be covering our top two trials that we've been covering all week. Of course, the Marine in Kentucky, Jonathan Price, that was shot and killed as he protected his wife. He didn't die on the battlefield. He didn't die serving his country. He died protecting his wife on her birthday. So we're going to cover that. And of course, the Wallace Bratcher case in North Carolina, that jury is deliberating and they should probably have a verdict uh, Monday of next week. We don't know, but the jury is in deliberation right now. But before we get into that, let's take a look at the top crime stories of the day. Take a look. And welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Joining me now is judge and trial attorney Ashley Wilcott from Atlanta, Georgia. Ashley, how are you this afternoon? Likewise. Now, listen, we just heard this case about this bus driver down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this, if this wasn't bad enough, he killed six little kids while driving a school bus. And now there's this, this allegation this claim of statutory rape. What's what's going on with this guy? What's your take on that? All right. So statutory rape is rape when there's um, it's because of the child's age. So in this particular case, the victim is 14. He was 26 at the time. Here's what's interesting to me. He admits that he had sex with the 14 year old multiple times. Mm. That's it. That to me is enough to prove the statutory rape or the aggravated statutory rape because this child's between the ages, I think, in Tennessee of 13 and 15, right. and he's at least 10 years older. So he's admitting to it. It's a crime. To me, it's an open shut case. I'm not real sure what the defense is going to be. Yeah, I'm not sure either. And I mean, there's nothing, you know, as a grown man that I would find anything attractive of a 14 year old, no matter how mature she looked or anything like that. I mean, th this is such a sad case on so many levels as if he hasn't destroyed enough lives. Now he's sitting here and having sex and he may consider it consensual sex with this 14 year old, but that's not how the law sees it, especially in Tennessee. I worked a lot of cases there when I was a police officer in Nashville for the exact same thing. Someone that was over a certain age having sex with someone on the age, what they consider is non consensual. And I don't care what she says, you can't do it. You can't break the law. Uh, we're going to jump into a special report about uh, the Jonathan Price case. And Ashley and I will be right back. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. And all I can say is, wow, that was a very heart-wrenching 911 call and I'm a guy that's heard a lot of 911 calls in my days in policing but man that was very heart-wrenching still with me is Ashley Wilcott Ashley what is your take on this 911 call and more importantly her words in this call what do you think that will play into the outcome of this case well, like you already said, Vincent, this is the heart of the case because it's really a horrific situation. He's mm -hmm. trying to defend his wife. He gets murdered. And what I want to remind the listeners about is this same audio is what was played by the prosecution during her opening statement. So what it did is it really set it up for the jury to understand the heart of the case and hear everything that we just heard. And it was played along with the video of the parking lot. And so it's really um, it is really heart wrenching. I think that the prosecution and opening did a really great job of laying out. This is what the evidence is going to show. This is chain of custody and this is how we link it all together to prove that these defendants murdered this person. Um, but this tape, like you already said, Vincent, this is the heart of the matter. This is going to get the compassion factor for people to say what a horrible, heinous crime. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things she said during that call, I think is really important here as this case goes along. The one who shot me had on a white shirt and we've already heard testimony about descriptions, suspect descriptions in this white shirt. And she says it in this 911 call. The one that shot me had on a white shirt. We're actually going to hear from Megan Price part of her testimony in this case in the murder of her Marine husband. Take a listen.
Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. You just heard testimony from Megan Price. She is the wife of the deceased Jonathan Price, who is a Marine who was shot and killed in Kentucky on her birthday while they were out celebrating a robbery that only netted $60. And still with me, Ashley Wilcott, criminal defense attorney and trial judge. Ashley, she just laid out some pretty interesting, pretty descriptive uh, features here. White T-shirt gun. She mentioned it had a silver, silver, silver barrel, um, the dreads. And that description matches one of the defendants in this case, Quincinio Canada. But is that enough at this point? At this point, it's not enough because that's one piece of the evidence. They have to now link the particular two defendants they are charging and trying with actually having the gun, uh, fingerprints on the gun, evidence to suggest that not only could it fit their description, but they also were in the proper you know, location with the weapon that was used to kill him. Uh, right. The other thing I want to say is what an amazing thing for a victim to have this much of a memory and description because that doesn't always happen. She also described the dreadlock. So it is a very important piece of the puzzle that she's able to say, hey, I saw and noticed all these things about the person who did this. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I remember from my days in policing, anytime I would talk to someone that had been robbed or something very traumatic like that, a lot of times their memory just doesn't work because this stuff happens so fast and you're so scared that a lot of times you may think you remember what happens, but when you start to think about it, the memory is not quite there. Now, you mentioned the gun and tying the gun to these uh, suspects that are on trial right now, these defendants on trial. One of, the thing, one of the things that's interesting here is the gun actually was not recovered from the two individuals on trial. It was recovered from someone else. I believe he tried to sell it to an ATF agent. Now, I know in my days of policing, a lot of times people would sell guns illegally on the street, especially if they've been involved in a crime. But mm -hmm. to your point, how do you tie these two defendants to a gun that was recovered from someone else? Well, what's interesting is it's my understanding that the evidence is going to show that the same gun was used by these defendants, I think, what, six months prior, if I got, I'm looking at my notes, if I got my time frame I right. Six days a, or so is when it was oh, stolen. Oh, right, in the armed robbery. And so there are going to be a lot of pieces to show that chain of evidence, to link them together and say that, yes, they used this weapon in this particular crime, killing this Marine. The other thing I wanted to point out, Vincent, is, you know, she, what an incredible witness for the prosecution, because not only is she strong enough to give the description and go through the testimony, look how vulnerable and heartbroken she still is. And this, this event happened in 2014. So here we are four years later, right. and she still, to me, just looks as devastated and heartbroken as if it just happened. Well, she, she lost her husband, who she hadn't been married to for a year at this mm -hmm. point. And I'm sure, you know, even four years uh, later, this is still something that really hurts her, and those tears really play heavily on the jury. Let's get back into the courtroom and hear more of Megan Price's testimony. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Ashley, we just heard more testimony from Megan Price, who is the one of the victims in this case. More importantly, she lost her husband on that day, uh, protecting her life for only $60. And again, she actually identified a person who fits the description of one of the defendants in this case. And she mentioned that she saw the barrel to Jonathan's head uh, just before he was shot. Uh, do you think that's weighing heavy on the jury here? I do think so. Not only that, but she was able to testify, Vincent, that specifically she remembers that the man said to her, give me your money. And so you can also then have voice recognition. The amount of detail right. she's able to give, the other detail is when she says who removed the purse and she says the man in the white shirt, how aggressively. So there are a lot of details that to me make it very credible. And at this point, I haven't heard anything that as a judge would make me question or as a jury member that would make me question her recollection of events. So far, I think I'd say, well, this must be exactly what happened. And it identifies a particular person. Yeah, I don't think we can definitely uh, question the events. There's, there's no disputing what happened there. Obviously, she was shot, her husband was shot and killed. Uh, but I think the defense is going to paint this picture that they picked out the wrong people 
just based on a random description. And as this case goes along, I think that will really come back to cause a lot of people to question this case. Did they pick the right people in this case? Because just to say there was a male black in a white T-shirt with dreads and another male black with short hair with the baseball cap, that describes a lot of people in the Lexington, Kentucky area. I've been to that area. So for her to just say it was this guy, he looked like this and that guy, I don't know if that's enough to convince this jury just yet that these are the uh, two responsible for this crime. What say you? I agree with you completely. And don't forget this, Vincent, at the beginning of her testimony, and I think the prosecution brought this out to try to make it not such a big deal. But if I were the defense, I'd bring this out. She and her husband, she stated under oath, had been drink. Well, she didn't exactly say that, that they had a designated driver who was a friend that they called her to pick them up. I think the defense is going to go there and it's going to say, so you've been drinking. How much had you been drinking? What right. did you have to drink? Because clearly, I think they're going to argue, not only is the description vague and could fit a lot of people, but if you'd had drinks, how can you recall exactly what you actually saw or who you could identify? Not only that, there was a statement she made to police when it came to identifying the suspects that we'll touch on later on in this show. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back and hear more from Megan Price. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. You just heard more testimony from Megan Price. Uh, this is the case down in Kentucky where her husband was shot and killed for a $60 robbery. Ashley is still with me. And Ashley, we just heard some pretty traumatic testimony. And it sounds like to me, she keeps saying the guy in the white shirt. So mm -hmm. if it's true, and this is Canada, it sounds like Canada was what is known as the primary aggressor in this entire thing. He had the gun. He did the shooting. He took the wallet. He took the purse. Sounds like if the defendant Canada is responsible for this, that he was more of the primary aggressor in this case. What do you think? I don't disagree with you based on the testimony so far, but I will point out, unless I misunderstood her testimony, that the um, when she said that she saw Jonathan in an altercation, it was with the other individual, not the one in the white shirt. So now she's linked the other individual into the crime and participating because he was in the altercation with Jonathan. But double check me, Vince, and I think that's what I heard her to say on her examination. Well, he may have been in, the other defendant may have been involved in the altercation, but I believe she said the person in the white shirt took his wallet out of his back pocket, which is, you know, pretty horrible in itself. He's down on the ground. He's bleeding out, if you will. He's about to die. And the last thing that happens to him is someone takes his wallet out of his back pocket, stripping his identity away, essentially, in this case. Um, what, do you, what do you think about the rest of her, her testimony as far as the, the scuffling and everything else? Do you think that she actually could identify who was scuffling with her husband or do you think she was more focused in her mind on looking at her husband and checking his condition versus who was actually scuffling with them and what was going on at that time? Well, I think she was able to clearly identify that the person scuffling was the other person, not the one in the white shirt. The problem is that you already pointed out, I think she's given us the best description she's going to be able to, which is the white shirt, dreadlocks, 5'9 to 5'10. The other individual, she was able to say between 20s and 30s um, age-wise, but that's the best description she's been able to give. So I think she's clearly identified two different people, mm -hmm. the role each had in the crime, but not yet been able to give us any district description to make clear it's these particular defendants. Now, that may follow, but I think that's where we are at this point in her testimony. No, I think you're right, but I think one of the most important things that she did say here is the other guy who had short hair was a little older, and we've heard testimony that mm -hmm. they uh, call each other unk and nephew because they're related, they're uncle and nephew. So that could come back and play a major factor in this case. Let's get back into the courtroom and hear more from Megan Price. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We're still, still hearing testimony from Megan Price. 
She is a victim in a robbery as well as a victim of lo losing her Marine husband in the state of Kentucky. And still with me, Ashley Wilcott. Ashley, we just saw uh, basically her wounds uh, mm -hmm. that she sustained during this robbery, and it sounds like it was pretty traumatic. I mean, the bullet exited uh, from the rear, so we know it was a 45 caliber handgun that was used during this robbery. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm a pretty good expert on guns. I shoot a lot. I carry a 9 millimeter Glock. 45 caliber is a pretty powerful weapon, and quite frankly, it actually could have killed her. A lot of people assume if you get shot in the leg that you don't die, but if it hits the right spot and if you don't get medical attention immediately, she very well could have died as well. Um, I don't know if they're being charged with the attempted murder of her versus the assault, but if they're, I believe they're only being charged with the robbery and the assault and the murder of uh, Jonathan Price. But wouldn't you as a prosecutor want to go after attempted murder because that's exactly what this is. L let's be honest, when you shoot someone, the intent is to kill. That's what bullets are made for. They're not made to just maim, they are made to kill. So wouldn't you be going for attempted murder in this case? Well, I think my understanding of the facts in this case is that she was accidentally, <laughs> accidentally, right? Take that for what it's worth, but that she was uh, shot as a result of the altercation. And so I don't know that the evidence would show that they intended to shoot and kill her, point the gun and pull the trigger. Instead, they had the gun, an ensuing shuffle ensued with Jonathan, and then the gun went off and she was shot in the leg. I think that's what the evidence is going to show. But Vincent, you may not have me back on, but I want to turn it back around on you because I'm not an expert in guns. So one of my questions for you is, does a 45 necessarily match the description she gave of a silver gun or can a, can, I don't know can a 45 be any color I'm yeah. just naive about that yeah a, a 45 could be any color but you know to your point of it was accidental during the scuffle I mean we covered a case here on the law and crime network Tex MacGyver we're all familiar with this case mm -hmm. he says it was an accident but he was charged and convicted a felony murder so I think if you're doing a commission of a felony which ie robbery then there should be no excuse that oh well it was just during the scuffle that she was shot I don't care she was shot and she could have died and I think that those charges should have been attempted murder in my opinion but hey I'm not a prosecutor and I don't make the law we want to take a quick listen to more of Megan Price's 911 call take a listen Wow, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Jonathan, I love you. Jonathan, I love you. I can't get to him. So that tells me that Jonathan Price died while his wife was just feet away from him. That's very, very tragic, uh, especially for a Marine that served his country, served our freedoms, and he dies on the street uh, for $60. Still with me is Ashley Wilcott, and you can see Jonathan Price there on our screen. Uh, Ashley, uh, during that 911 call, she said they both had guns. Uh, again, she mentioned the individual in the white shirt. Um, but I'm still going back and forth with do we have enough in this case? The, the defense during her opening statement said, hey, there was DNA under Jonathan's fingernails that should have been examined, which wasn't examined. Police made this assumption based on these descriptions that they were responsible for not only the robbery that happened six days prior, but the murder as well. Do we have enough going into this case to say these two individuals did it? I think it really is going to depend on the rest of her testimony and whether or not she's able to offer anything like the voice identification, um, any special marks. You know, she doesn't offer any of that. And so I do think this is a real question for the jury. Is there enough based on her description of these individuals to say it was beyond a reasonable doubt and all of the jury members have to find it was beyond a reasonable doubt that these two defendants were the same two men who committed this awful crime. Yeah, and I think what's uh, going to be important here as this goes on, uh, she didn't pick them out of a lineup because she said, and I quote, I didn't want to be responsible for making the wrong choice. And I think that may come back mm -hmm. to hurt the prosecution here because... 
here's one of the star witnesses in this case, not picking them out of the lineup. We heard testimony from another individual that was involved in the robbery who said, well, if they didn't all look alike, they would be dead, and yet he picks them out of the lineup. So that, of course, the defense is going to come back and say, well, you said they all look alike, so how do we know that you picked out the right people in this case? This case is not as simple as it seems, I got to tell you. We're going to take a quick bit break, and we'll be right back here on the Law and Crime Network. Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm your host, Vincent Hill. We're switching gears now. We're talking about the Wallace Bratcher case in North Carolina. And just to provide a little background, uh, he's accused, along with his co-defendant, who actually pled, of hiring each other's wives uh, to work, but yet not doing any work, collecting a salary at taxpayer money. The whole scheme was allegedly uh, concocted over a slice of pepperoni pizza at a pizza parlor there in North Carolina. Uh, right now, the jury is in deliberation. There was no court today. They will resume on Monday. Still with me is Ashley Wilcott, trial attorney and judge. And Ashley, you know, we, we've gone back and forth about, about this case. Uh, Wallace Bratcher actually defended himself. Mm -hmm. When we were on last time, we said, I don't know if that's a good idea. I still don't know if that is a good idea, especially considering he's facing up to 18 years in prison, but do you think that the prosecution did enough to say, yes, this man committed a crime, and yes, he should serve 18 years in prison, and we can see uh, Wallace Bratcher up there on the screen. Ashley, do you think that this can come out to 18 years in prison, or what say you? Oh, sure. I think that we don't know what this jury's going to do, and it wouldn't surprise me if they acquit him or if they come out with 18 years. So I think one of the important things is that I think the prosecution proved the elements of the case if you just looked at their case alone. But Bradshaw, you and I have talked about this, Vincent. He asked a lot of questions and long, detailed questioning that was convoluted mm -hmm. at times. And that may have been enough to poke holes in the prosecution's case and cause to jury at least one juror to say, hey, listen, I don't think it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And so I, I, this is one, honestly, usually I'll say to you, I have a gut opinion and this is what it is. This is not one I can predict. Yeah, I, I think we're all there on, on that one. Uh, speaking of the prosecution, let's take a listen to what the prosecution had to say during their closing statements. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I want to make one correction. That was actually the closing arguments of the defense. Wallace Bradshaw, again, he's representing himself in this case, this alleged wife swap case. Uh, where $48,000 was allegedly uh, obtained for no work. Still with me is Ashley Wilcott, trial attorney and judge. And Ashley, four words. Do you believe that? You notice that was his question to everything. So he's asking the jury, do you really believe that what the state is saying, I actually did? I was involved in this great elaborate cover-up. Do you think that is playing in the jury's mind to say, maybe this guy really didn't have anything to do with it? Well, I think it's consistent. His theory of the case and the way he questioned witnesses and then his closing argument has always been, you can't blame me. I didn't do anything wrong. You can't trust the state. Do you even believe what they put on? The other thing he said at one point was, you know, here's some evidence information. Shouldn't the state have put that on? So he's passing mm -hmm. the buck passing blame, um, saying to them, basically, don't find the state credible. And ironically, he used to be the state. So here he is arguing, I don't think you should believe the state and the evidence that they put on. You shouldn't believe what they're saying. Yet I was the state okay. as the elected DA. So you should believe what I'm saying when I was the state. So it's really a convoluted, messy set of facts in a case for the jury to decide. I don't find him credible, but, but that's just my personal opinion. I respect the jury may find that he is credible and he didn't do it. You, you know what, Ashley, I, ne I never thought about it like that, but you're right. He <laughs> was the state. Now he's asking the jury to believe me, even though I used to stand up before you as the state, as the prosecutor. So it will be interesting to see what happens. Now let's get to the courtroom and hear the prosecution's closing statements in the Wallace Bratcher case.
Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. You just heard uh, closing arguments from the prosecution in the Wallace Bradshaw case. Again, this is the former district attorney uh, prosecutor who is accused of doing a Y swap and taking taxpayers for $48,000, which is a pretty nice chunk of money, especially considering there's a lot of people in this country that don't make that and wish they did make that. Uh, still with me is Ashley Wilcott, judge and trial attorney. Uh, Ashley, what do you think about those closing arguments by the prosecution? One of the things I noticed is he was basically saying Bratcher was trying to distract the jury from his actual involvement in this. What do you think? Do you think that the prosecution relayed that to the jury? I had trouble finding, following the prosecution's closing argument. So they started by saying, you know, don't believe his counter story. And here are the reasons we're here. And then he quickly followed that with, and here's why we're not here. And he started going into those details. So, you know, it's always easy to Monday night quarterback, but I feel like it was a little convoluted and it could have been really easy to stand up and say, hey, he's distracting you. Here's why we're here. Here's what happened. You must find him guilty on this count, this count, and this count, because the evidence shows that he did ABC. So I felt like he was trying to get his feet under him to say this is why you should convict him, but it was a little convoluted to start. Yeah. Um, again, that's the Wallace Bratcher case in North Carolina. The jury is deliberating. Court resumes Monday morning in that case, and, of course, we will cover it right here on the Law and Crime Network, we want to switch gears back to Kentucky and the Quincinio Canada and Dewan Mausoleum case. They're accused of murdering a Marine, Jonathan Price, on his wife's birthday for a robbery that only netted $60. Now, the defense made some pretty good points in her opening statements uh, regarding DNA that could have uh, linked someone else to these robberies. Uh, the gun that was recovered was recovered from someone else other than the defendant um, in this case. So there's a lot of stuff in this case, Ashley, that right now is still not saying we know who did it. Right now, it's still a who done it, in, at least in the jury's minds, based on what the defense has said. That's right. And so remember the opening statement by the prosecutor, she did a very good job saying, Here's the video, the heart of the case, and this is the trauma this woman went through in, when watching her husband get murdered. And then she went through and she actually said, Vincent, there are all these tiny pieces of evidence and we're going to have to prove A, B, C, D, E, F, G to put together, paint the full picture, that it's enough evidence that you're going to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that these two individuals are the ones who murdered Jonathan. So I think that they've already laid the groundwork to say this testimony is a small piece of the testimony they're going to have to present to prove it was these two defendants who committed this crime. Yeah, and you said it best, beyond a reasonable doubt. And it just takes that one doubt to either hang a jury or acquit these two individuals of this crime. Now, there was a detective that has been testifying, Detective Timothy Upchurch. He was the detective that handled the robbery that occurred six days before Jonathan Price was killed at a quality inn there in Lexington, Kentucky. Let's hear some of his testimony. Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. You are hearing testimony from Detective Timothy Upchurch with the Lexington Police Department. And still with me is Ashley Wilcott, judge and trial attorney. And Ashley, I think uh, one of the very important things that I saw there that this uh, detective testified to is he actually gave the serial number of the stolen 45 caliber that was stolen at the uh, Quality Inn just six days before this murder in the process contends that that weapon was actually used to kill Jonathan Price. And according to uh, testimony of one of the victims there, he actually picked out the two defendants in this case. So with that said, one would assume that, okay, the gun was stolen here. This individual picked him out of a lineup. Mm -hmm. This guy was shot. Jonathan Price was shot and killed. His wife was shot and injured in the leg that yes we have our guy but there's a big problem with this gun here and we talked about it earlier in the show it was not recovered from these two defendants so one of the things i would look for even as an investigator to make sure i had an, 
a, a solid case would be either the person that we recovered the gun from identifying these two defendants, Canada and uh, his uncle, to say, yes, I purchased it from them on the street for X amount of dollars, or some type of DNA evidence linking that gun, and there you see Canada on your screen, linking that gun to these two defendants. But we haven't heard that as of yet. So what do you think that will do with this trial as it goes goes along? Well, Vincent, I think you've identified the exact issue, and that is the prosecution, in my opinion, is literally going to have to put that gun mm -hmm. in their hands at the time that this Marine was shot and killed. And they're going to have to link them to that gun in some way, shape, or form. I think they just haven't presented that evidence yet. But if they fail to do that as defense, I would certainly argue reasonable doubt, because that is a crucial element of this crime to identify these individuals as the same ones who uh, robbed and shot and killed uh, Jonathan. Yeah, and, and sometimes what happens, and I definitely don't want to Monday morning quarterback these, these investigators, but I've been on that side of the, the tracks where I was a police officer. Sometimes we get tunnel vision and we want to go after the person that we think did this. Oh, this guy had dreads. This guy had short hair. We don't know what this other individual who had the gun looks like, but I would definitely question his involvement in this case. I would definitely press him to say, hey, man, this gun was used in a homicide and an assault. We need to know everything. And maybe there's something that the prosecution is not presenting at this time as it relates to this individual. But unless they come up with that, I think there is that reasonable doubt that these two individuals were involved. What do you think? I agree with you. And I think it's important to note, again, this crime um, occurred in 2014. We're mm -hmm. now in 2018. Right. And while the continuances were for court reasons, it did provide additional time for investigators to not be under the gun, so to speak, and have to, you know, investigate super quickly. So I'm hopeful with that information. I agree with you that they've looked at all of those aspects and that we're going to hear all of that evidence as the prosecution's case proceeds. Yeah, we'll have to wait to see as this goes uh, further in trial. Let's get back into the courtroom and hear more from Detective Timothy Upchurch. Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We're still hearing testimony from Detective Timothy Upchurch with the Lexington, Kentucky Police Department. And Ashley, uh, he touched on several things here I want to point out. He mentioned uh, trying to get video surveillance from the Quality Inn. I think he said he had to go to the Shell Station, which was the only uh, business there that had some type of uh, video surveillance. Uh, but one thing I think he touched on that I think is crucial, uh, well, two things, the shell casing uh, and the uh, lineup. Because as you know, again, I, I've fired a lot of guns between the military and police. Bullets have what's known as a striation, which is basically a fingerprint of that bullet, right? Each gun has its own striation marks when they're fired. That's how investigators are able to tie one shell casing or one bullet recovered uh, from one crime scene to the next and match it to that gun. So he mentioned he got the uh, some spent shell casings from the individual that was robbed, that uh, his gun was stolen. Was, they were able to match those. Uh, mm -hmm. But one thing in particular I think he touched on was the lineup. And typically how a lineup works, it's called a six-pack. Uh, for those that don't know, it's usually six photos. And what investigators have to do is get someone that looks similar to the description. So, for instance, uh, Canada was described as male black with braids and a big nose. Obviously, my face cannot be in that lineup because I don't have dreads. Uh, I hope my nose is not too big, but I wouldn't match that description. Uh, so do you think the investigator in this case, Ashley, is doing everything uh, by the book and trying to get to the bottom of what happened to Jonathan Price? 
So far, his testimony seems to indicate that, yes, he knows how to investigate the case. He's clearly setting out, let's take your lineup example, exactly how he did it to show the jury and indicate, listen, I did it with like people and individuals that meet this description, that match this description, so that he did not at all try to influence who the person would pick out of the lineup based on the pictures he put in there. So he's mm -hmm. doing everything that needs to be done to say, listen, I did it the right way, and this was the outcome as a result of me doing it the right way. He did the same thing with the shell casings to explain exactly um, how he linked those together. And, and so far, I think it's a, you would have better expertise in this, but to me, it sounds like a very good investigation in terms of meeting all the criteria to look at it objectively and trying to find out exactly who did the crime. Right. Uh, it, it definitely does. I mean, the detective is doing everything by the book, but here's where I see a little bit of a problem. Anytime you're loading bullets into a magazine, this was a semi-automatic pistol, typically you're loading that with your thumb and your finger. So the DNA are the fingerprints that are likely on those bullets, unless the suspects in these murders change those out, are going to be the previous gun owner, the person that the gun was stolen from. So again, it goes back to what DNA do you have on these defendants to say, yes, these were the ones committing the crime? Because I, I doubt if the gun was loaded at the time that they just mysteriously went out to get more rounds to make sure that the other person's prints weren't on there. I mean, street cr criminals are smart, but they're not that smart. So we still may have a problem in this case. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back discussing this case of a Marine that was murdered in Kentucky. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We've been covering a trial in Kentucky where a Marine, Jonathan Price, was shot and killed while protecting his wife during a robbery. Still with me is Ashley Wilcott, judge and trial attorney. We've been listening to Detective Tim Upchurch, and he's been talking about how he investigated this case. We want to get back into the courtroom and hear more of his testimony, and we'll be right back to discuss. First. I showed uh, Jessica Rutherford uh, the first time. Okay. Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We're still hearing from Detective Timothy Upchurch, Lexington uh, Police. He's actually talking about the lineup that he showed the victims here of uh, this robbery. Uh, and actually, one of the things I noticed, in again, in my police days, you know, I had to do a few things like this. Um, he, he said he did not speak to them. And just so our viewers understand, uh, you never want to go into a photo lineup as an investigator and say anything that may be suggestive. You never want to have your finger over a certain picture saying, do you see anyone here that looks familiar, right? So I think he did exactly what he was supposed to do. He stayed away. He kept his distance. He didn't speak to them. And more importantly, a lot of times people don't realize how certain are you? Because that can come back in court to mean, oh, you weren't 100% sure, you were like 20% sure, it looked like the person that robbed me, but, and when you throw that but into a lineup, that can come back as, you know, bad for the prosecution. What say you? I agree. And here the prosecution's doing their job because, Vincent, they are going through every single detail of what he did and how he did it to take any steam away from the defense trying to say, oh, he did it in a way that his finger was over it or he may have said something. This prosecution and its line of questioning is making certain that they leave no stone unturned to prove he did it the right way and he did not bias or influence the person in, in conducting the lineup. Yeah, I mean, this Detective Upchurch, I mean, you heard his testimony. He's been doing this for 10 years. I think he said he started out in burglary and then went to robbery homicide. And those are the, the big guys. Those are the guys that come in and investigate the robberies and the homicides. So it's definitely not your average patrolman. It's not someone that's working residential crimes. It's not someone that's working car theft. I mean, this is what he's been doing for the last eight and a half years of his career. So I think he did everything by the book in this case. We want to go back into the courtroom and hear more from Timothy Upchurch.
Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Still hearing testimony from Detective Timothy Upchurch in the murder trial of two defendants, Quincinio Canada and Dewan Malazan, um, who are uncle and nephew. They're accused of uh, robbery and murdering a Marine, Jonathan Price, in the state of Kentucky. Ashley, it looks like he's doing an outstanding job as far as his investigative skills, but <laughs> Having worn that uniform and done this job, I know when it comes to cross, usually the defense will hammer, hammer, hammer that investigator and the sweat starts to run down your arms and down your back while you're sitting there in that chair. And I think what we're about to hear now is a little bit of the cross-examination of Detective Timothy Upchurch. Let's see how he stands up to the defense. Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We heard a little bit of cross-examination in the detective in this case, Detective Timothy Upchurch, Lexington Police Department. And Ashley, he was talking about uh, the photo lineup. And one of the things the defense brought up, and maybe you can talk this, because when I've done a lineup, I've never recorded it, because to the detective's point, the minute that red light goes on on that recorder, a lot of people clam up, and they may clam up for different reasons. A lot of people say, I don't want my voice, I don't want retaliation, I don't want this. You know, so it's a lot of departments, it's not mandatory that you're actually audio recording a photo lineup, because here's the thing, if you're listening to a tape that says, yes, it was number five, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can see exactly what happened in that photo lineup. Uh, so. I'm not quite sure where she was going with, well, you didn't record the lineup, so how do we know that they picked this individual? Maybe you can help me out and explain that. Sure. She's just trying to discredit the witness, and mm -hmm. so she doesn't necessarily know what answers he's going to give. She asks the questions that she wants the jury to start thinking about in their minds right. to say, wait a minute. So that's what she's doing, trying to discredit him. Yeah, and one of the things I found interesting, too, I think there was a, a part during this testimony that uh, she said that he didn't go to the robbery scene uh, for at least a month before he went to uh, look into this robbery. So it, it, it could be for a lot of reasons. It could be because, you know, he didn't know it was associated at the time. He was working other leads, which is part of an investigation, especially a murder investigation. So... Uh, do you think that has any bearing here? Well, I think part of what she might tie that to is what you've already raised, Vincent. At the same time, she asked about DNA and said, and you didn't take, nobody took any DNA samples from the room, right? From anything found in the room. And he then explained a hotel, it's going to be too many people have been in and out and it's not standard procedure. But I think she's starting to lay the groundwork for, he wasn't there at the time. He failed to take DNA, although he explained it well in his answer and we're missing crucial information because of that to say that these defendants are the actual perpetrators here. Yeah, I mean, you know, in this day and age, DNA is everything. I take it over video surveillance. I, I definitely take it over eyewitness account because I know those can be uh, misconstrued, especially, again, in the heat of the moment. You know, it was a red car. It was a black car. It was a gray car. Sure. He had on a white shirt. It was a brown shirt. So I take DNA over everything when I'm investigating a case. And as a juror, I'm sure they take DNA over everything. That's been how cases have been solved and exonerated for many years. Uh, we're going to get back to this, but first, let's take a look at the top crime stories of the day. Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Those were the top crime stories of the day. Ashley, we are almost at an end. We had about three minutes left. We've been covering this trial in Kentucky and the death of Jonathan Price, who is a Marine who uh, was killed during a robbery uh, for $60, which is really, really sad in itself. Uh, this guy went out, he served his country, uh, and he was killed right here on U.S. soil. So that's, that's very tragic. And as a veteran myself, that really hits home. You can see his picture there up on the screen. Ashley, in the two minutes we have left, do you think in this case, who do you think is doing the better job here in presenting this case? I mean, the defense came out uh, like a rock star in her opening statements and during the cross-examination. Uh, the prosecution, of course, is trying to paint this picture, but who do you think in the uh, time that we have left is doing the better job here? 
You know, Vincent, I don't think I could say who's doing the better job. Here's the problem for the defense. The prosecution, again, has the heart of this case. Mm -hmm. They hit hard at the beginning of their opening and, and showed the video, and you could hear the audio of what Megan went through. And basically, you could hear her voice change from the beginning of there was a man, there was a gun, I've been shot in the leg. And then it's almost like she was witnessing her husband die because then she got more panicked right. and more distraught saying, I love you, I love you, and I can't get to him, I can't get to him. The defense has an up her, uphill battle, frankly, to fight against that emotional plea to hold these two accountable for that crime. Yeah, absolutely. And that case, along with the Wallace Bratcher case, will resume Monday, and we will be covering both of those here on the Law and Crime Network. Again, we've been talking about Jonathan Price, who was murdered uh, on his wife's birthday. Uh, they were out celebrating her birthday and a robbery took place. Uh, he was shot in the back. He died. I believe the bullet actually entered his heart. So there was really no chance of survival in that. His wife was shot in the leg. She actually watched her husband die just feet away from her. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. Ashley, thank you so much for sticking with us for the last couple of hours. We greatly appreciate it. We will see you back here on the Law and Crime Network on Monday. Thank you so much, and good night. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, where we cover some of the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. And we have a lot to cover, so let's get started right now. We are continuing to wait for a verdict in the Wallace Bradshaw courtroom out of North Carolina. Now, we believe deliberations will continue Monday. The jury is not deliberating, deliberating today, excuse me. But this case has been really an interesting one to follow. It is about a district attorney who is on trial and faces six felony counts and one misdemeanor charge in connection with allegedly operating an illegal scheme to defraud the people of North Carolina by employing the wife of another district attorney, Craig Blitzer, paying her $48,000, that's of taxpayer money, for work that she didn't do. And as if that wasn't bad enough, he's not only accused of authorizing this, but trying to cover it up. Cindy Blitzer, the, she, you see her right there in that photo, and her husband, Craig Blitzer, have testified against Bradshaw. Bradshaw's been representing himself in this case. We're going to play you some of his closing argument later on where he provides his last attempt to the jury to save his life because if convicted, he faces up to 18 years in prison. This has been a really fascinating case to watch, and we are going to keep you updated as soon as we have more information about what is happening, including some questions we're asked by the jury yesterday during their deliberations. And we'll talk to you about that. Maybe it gives you an insight into where they're going or at least what they're thinking. So that's the Wallace Bradshaw case. The other case that we're covering here on Law and Crime is uh, it's dark today. We are going to continue it back on Monday, but there is a lot to recap about it. It is about the killing of a Marine named Jonathan Price. Two men are on trial for the killing of this young Marine, Quincinio Canada and Dewan Mulazam. These two men are not only charged with the murder of Mr. Price, but they're also charged 
with first degree robbery, first degree assault. It's alleged that they went up to Mr. Price and his girlfriend, Megan Price, shot him in the back and shot her in the leg. She survived. All to steal her purse, which only contained $60. So if this is all true, this man died over a fight for $60. Really a horrible, horrible situation. But what makes this case unique is the fact that six days before this shooting, there was a robbery at the Quality Inn Motel. And investigators believe that evidence from that robbery links the defendants to this crime. We have a short report summarizing what has happened so far in this case. Take a look. The Kentucky trial of the shooting death of a Marine is underway. 26-year-old Quincinio Canada and 34-year-old Dewan Mulazam are charged with murder and assault for an incident outside a bar in 2014. The two men allegedly approached Corporal Jonathan Price and his wife Megan when one of them tried to snatch her purse. When Jonathan got involved, a fight started and the corporal was fatally shot in the back. Megan suffered a non-fatal bullet wound to her leg. Both men are also charged for a robbery six days prior to the Price shooting. Law enforcement connected them to both crimes by identifying the 45 caliber handgun used in the robbery and the shooting. For Law and Crime, I'm Rachel Stockman. Thank you, Rachel. And we are going to play you later some of the testimony from Jonathan's wife, Megan, again, who was shot in the leg when this happened. And she testified in basically in front of the people that she believes murdered her husband. This has been a really emotionally charged case, but I want to talk a little bit more about it now and break it down. So joining me on set is trial attorney Brad Micklin, and we're very happy to have him. Brad, it's great to have you here on the program for the first time. Thanks, Jesse. I, I appreciate coming in. I, I love the show. Big fan. Well, thank you for that. So let's talk about this case. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in it. Mm -hmm. You have a Marine who was killed. You have a wife who was testifying against the defendants. And these guys, the, their defense attorneys have said systematically that the police made a mistake here, that they went with a narrow view, automatically said that our clients did this, when they're trying to say there's all this evidence that maybe they didn't. What do you think about it from a, a general perspective? Well, I think it's interesting. You know, as a defense attorney, you're always going to try to poke holes into the prosecution's case. But I think even more important than those points is the testimony from Megan herself, as you alluded to. You know, if she were to get on the stand and say, you know, you're the person that shot me in the leg or you're the one that shot and killed my husband, I think that would have been the literal nail on her coffin. But she didn't say that. And what she did say was that she couldn't or, or at least didn't want to identify the assailants. And I think that's going to really, really play large into the defense position here. These guys have distinguishing characteristics, including a face tattoo on Mr. Canada. The defense made a big point yesterday of poking, poking that out and during that police lineups, they actually covered it up. They covered it up because according to the police, they couldn't find other people with face tattoos and that wasn't an identifying feature um, that was described. So they actually covered it up because they said if they kept the face tattoo in, in a lineup where everybody else didn't have face tattoos, it would have suggested something to the victims who were trying to point them out. Does that make sense to you? You know, it's hard to say really at this point whether or not it makes sense. I think, again, as a defense attorney, you're going to do as much as you can to have as many different items to poke holes into. And I think alleging police misconduct is always going to be a popular theme. You know, there's a lot of history in, in high-profile cases where that's been alleged, and it really plays into the hands of the jury. All right. Well, let's uh, we'll talk more about this case in a minute. But before we go to our main trials, the ones that we're talking about here today, I want to bring you all back and talk about our top crime stories here on Law and Crime. These are the biggest news stories in the country uh, in a legal perspective right now. Let's play that right now. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. MMA superstar Conor McGregor is reportedly seeking a plea deal in connection with his participation in an attack on another fighter's bus caught on camera in April. The 29-year-old mixed martial artist faces 12 charges, including two charges of misdemeanor assault and one charge of felony criminal mischief for his role in the melee. McGregor's next scheduled court date is July 26th. 
The district attorney's office in Los Angeles is reportedly reviewing a sex crime case against actor Sylvester Stallone. The allegations were first reported in November 2017, but the alleged incident occurred in the 1990s. Investigators have yet to release any other facts relating to the nature of the alleged sex crime. Stallone's attorneys admit their client had a consensual relationship with the woman, but categorically deny any allegations of criminal activity. A high school student in Henderson, Nevada is dead after playing a modified version of Russian roulette and two other teens are charged in connection with his killing. 16-year-old Jaden Caruso is charged with murder with a deadly weapon and 17-year-old Cody Harlan is charged with accessory to murder after the fact and destroying evidence for their alleged roles in the shooting death of 16-year-old Matthew Minkler. Caruso reportedly fatally shot Minkler in the face while playing a modified version of Russian roulette and reportedly bragged on social media while Minkler was still bleeding on the floor. Harlan allegedly helped Caruso clean up the blood and move Minkler's body. Both teens are being charged as adults and are being held at Clark County Detention Center. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. Thank you, Anthony. Wow, those are some stories to really to follow. Go to lawandcrime.com to learn a little bit more about them, as well as some of the top legal and news stories, again, on lawandcrime.com. But let's talk a little bit more about that Russian roulette story. Uh, Brad, my question to you is, why were they charged with murder? I mean, they said it's a modified version of Russian roulette, but I'm imagining if Russian roulette went bad, murder wouldn't be the charge. What am I missing here? Well, I, I think there's a couple of issues that are going on here, and it, it's going to turn and develop as the story continues because I think we're just at the early stages of it. But the, the story seems to be that the defendants are at least claiming that it was Russian roulette and that the victim himself may have actually pulled the trigger. While that may be true, and that would certainly limit or reduce their culpability. But at the same time, even if that were the case, if they were involved in this incident or they brought the gun, their intent may actually transfer over into a different crime or into murder, even though they may not have actually intended to kill him. But is there evidence that they wanted him dead? I mean, I read a little bit about this story, and it seems that they might have had a grudge against him. There might have been something going on that we we don't know about yet. Have you read about that? Well, there's a few things that are in the news right now, and uh, the main thing that I've heard about is a social media post from one of the uh, alleged uh, defendants where there's a question that maybe he admitted to this crime and maybe there was some motive. But the problem with social media is, although it's been with us for a long time, its use in the courtroom is, is relatively new. So there's always questions surrounding authenticity, admissibility, and then also just credibility. You know, how many times have you seen a Facebook post from somebody saying something about how great their life is, but then you get to know the person's really not that case? So the mere fact that they posted something that may have suggested their involvement doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate. In these kinds of cases where people take a, victims take a role in a very dangerous activity, is there any defense that they assume the risk of what's going to happen? Again, we don't know all the details of what ha what's happening in this case yet, but if they were involved in consensual Russian roulette, which I can't believe I'm saying, and ironically this happened in Las Vegas, I mean, uh, this is not the kind of gambling I think anybody wanted, but again, is that a way that the defense could say, look, he assumed the risk? You're meaning the victim? The meaning the victim. Well, I mean, to some extent, certainly. If, if you are engaged in a, in a dangerous activity like that, or even playing with a loaded gun in any way, you're certainly assuming some of the risk. That doesn't necessarily negate the fact that the other two individuals who were involved didn't cause or create a dangerous situation that led to his death. Weird part about it is I hear that, again, one of the victims, uh, excuse me, one of the defendants allegedly shot him point blank in the face. How is that a modified version of Russian roulette? My understanding was that the victim will always pick the gun up and put it to his head or his mm -hmm. face and pull the trigger. I guess that's where things get a little weird for the defendants. Well, and it's going to be a troubling defense because, you know, we know what Russian roulette is supposed to suggest, but we don't really know what happened here yet. So it's going to be really important to find out how he died, where the gun came from, whose fingerprints were on there. I think once these pieces start to come together through the testimony and in the media, then we'll have a better sense of where the case is going to go. It's a really tragic case. We're going to follow it more here on Law & Crime. As soon as there's an update, we'll make sure to let you know, as we always do. And again, go to lawandcrime.com to learn a little bit more about it. But let's switch gears and focus back on the Marine case that we've been focusing out of Kentucky. Uh, these two men uh, who are charged with the murder of this young Marine, Jonathan Price, as well as injuring his wife, Megan Price. Now, that is what I want to talk about right now. Megan Price, her 911 phone call was played for the jury. And this is not just any 911 phone call. This is the call she made 
right after the shooting and the robbery. Her husband is lying on the ground bleeding out. She was shot in the leg. I want to play you this 911 phone call right now. Let's do that. That was Megan Price's 911 phone call after her husband, Jonathan Price, was shot in the back and after she was shot in the leg. So what impact, what impact did that have on the jury? That becomes the question. Let's bring back in trial attorney Brad Micklin. I'm going to ask you that question. What impact do you think that had when the jury heard that? Well, I mean, it certainly brings the, the case home. I mean, you know, your heart goes out to Megan when you listen to this tape. Um, but it offers, I think, very little for the case itself. I mean, there was a brief description of dreadlocks and the color of the, the assailants, but I think it was used more for the heart-wrenching aspect of it to really put the jurors in the moment of what was happening to her and her husband. And I think that's usually to play more on the emotions of the jury than actual facts of the case. Dreadlocks. Quincinio Canada had those dreadlocks. We show you his mugshot all the time on, this, on our network. That is a really strong distinguishing feature. Now, again, he was put in a lineup where there were other people with dreadlocks, but he was picked out. This seems like a very strong case against uh, the defendants. Would you agree? Well, it's hard to say. A lot of people would believe that the case is strong against them because of the identification both of um, Megan Price, but also the victims in the hotel incident a few days earlier. But at the same time, there was also mentioned in the defense opening statement that there's DNA evidence that was found that doesn't match either of the defendants. So it's going to be questionable how that actually gets introduced and whether or not that actually hurts or helps the identification issues. Taking a step back, I'm, I keep forgetting, by the way, that this case has taken, what, four years to finally get to trial? That has been an issue of itself. Why has this case taken so long to finally get to trial there in Kentucky? You know, it's hard to say. You know, as, as you know, we have a right to a speedy trial, but you also need to have a fair trial. So there's a lot of issues that are going to play into any type of litigation, especially a, a murder case like this. I mean, you have a long period of discovery where you have to get investigations and witness statements and exchange information. There's also always going to be a lot of pretrial motions to exclude evidence or to uh, bring in or out different people that will be testifying. And then I think lastly, after you get past all these hurdles, you have a lot of people's schedules. You know, we forget that the court system is really just made up of people. So you're always going to have here, you have several attorneys, you have a judge, you have several victims and families. I think coordinating all these people to get together to start a trial is also going to be a very large consideration. I think the scheduling of the public defenders was a big issue because they, they had other cases lined up. The judge in this case, um, I believe her name is Judge Goodwine, did not, was not happy about keep, uh, you know, pushing this off and pushing this off and pushing this off. I think it was either last summer or last spring when she really got fed up at this. But... Here we are today. The trial is finally happening, and we are covering it here on Law and Crime. We talked a little bit about Megan Price, uh, really a widow now, the widow of her Marine husband. We played you her 911 phone call, but now I want to play you her testimony in court. This is, if not the most, the, the, I, I, I would say probably the most important witness in this whole case. So let's play you that right now. 
At some point, did you and Jonathan go outside? We did. Okay. And what were you going to do outside? We went out to talk. back into it as soon as we have it, uh, because I want to play you Megan Price. She is, again, the widow of this Marine husband, okay? And this Marine husband, it seems, was just trying to protect her from an armed robbery gone bad. Now, what makes this as an interesting case is we talk about the gun. So the gun that was allegedly used was the same gun that police say was stolen from a, mo uh, a Quality Inn six days before that these three individuals who were staying at a Quality Inn, they, two of them were paramedics, that they were there, they were at there for, I think, point, a gun you knife show, and all of a sudden these two men walk around the corner from the Quality Inn and hold them up at gunpoint, push them back into the room, steal a bunch of their things from their room, including a gun that belonged to one of the victims. That gun, prosecutors, investigators say, is the same gun that was used to kill Jonathan Price. And they are using that bit of evidence to say that this is the defendants, these are the defendants who did this. And it's a, it's a really sad case, and we're trying to understand a little bit more about it. And Megan Price was um, talking a little bit more about it, and we're going to play this clip in as, as soon as we have it, where she talks about having trouble to first identifying the defendants, and that became a big issue in this case, because the defense attorneys have said, wait a second, prosecution? No, 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 no. You targeted our defendants immediately. We had, there were tips coming in, there was a, even an attorney with a tip about this case, and you chose to ignore all of it. Look at the DNA, fingerprints, uh, not fingerprints, excuse me, DNA that was underneath Jonathan Price's fingernails, that didn't belong to any of the defendants. And the gun, which I just mentioned, was not in the hands of the defendants, nope. This gun was fa found in the hands of a different in individual named Antonio Fry, but he wasn't checked out in terms of this case and why. That's really what the defense is trying to say. Okay, we have Megan Price's clip for you right now. So let's play you some of her testimony right now. At some point, did you and Jonathan go outside? We did. Okay. And what were you going to do outside? We went out to talk. We went out to talk. Um, do you remember what time that was? A little after midnight. A little after midnight. And when you went outside, where did you go? Uh, we went and sat on uh, our friend's car that was our designated driver. We were sitting on her bumper. And is that where you all were sitting when you all were talking? Yes. Is that where you were the whole time you were out there? Yes. At some point, um, did you um, reach out to your friend? Um, let me ask this. What was your designated driver's name? Betty. Okay. At some point, did you reach out to her um, and indicate to her that you wanted to go home? Yes, I texted her a few different times. And I called her a couple of times. Okay. And do you remember what time the first time was? A little after 12.30. Okay. Um, if her records indicate about 12.39, would that sound about right? Yes, ma'am. And then you texted her at that point, and do you remember what you texted her? That I, I was ready for her to take me home. Okay. And who was to go home when you were saying that? Me and John. Okay. So the two of you were going to leave to go home at that point? Yes. Did she respond? She did not. <clears throat> did you reach out to her again? Do you remember about what time that was? Her records indicate about 124. Does that sound about right? Yes. How long do you think you all were outside um, talking? 
นี่นะฮะตอนนั้นอาวุธ What you are drinking while you're sitting outside While you were sitting outside, did some people approach you? Yes. Tell us about that. Someone walked up. I saw a man walking towards me with a gun. Do you remember um, what the person was wearing? A white T-shirt. <coughs> remember anything else about that person? He was black and had dreadlocks. Do you remember about how tall he was? Five nine, five ten. Do you remember anything about? Anything else about his clothes? Do you remember um, anything else about the gun? It was a what appeared to be silver. It was a silver barrel. Do you know the difference between a revolver and a semi-automatic? Yes, I do. Do you recall which, if, if the gun was either one of those? It was a semi-automatic. Okay. That was some of the testimony of Megan Price. And that is really one of the key witnesses in this case. She is the widow of Jonathan Price, that Marine who was killed. And the question becomes, who killed him? That really is the question. And we're trying to understand what happened in this night when, I think it was four years ago when this happened, and trying to understand why is Jonathan dead. So let's bring back in our very special guest, trial attorney Brad Micklin. Any witness, including a, a person who was right there during the shooting, how do, we rem how do we judge if we're sitting in the jury? How do we judge everything that they saw? and everything that they heard four years ago, especially when she was the person who got shot in the leg. So I imagine the defense would try to pick up on that or at least put uh, uh, something in the minds of the juror, jury that you know, her recollection might not be everything you imagine. Well, yeah, and there's mixed opinions about that when it comes to a trial work. Because some people think that your identification, your memory is, is poor when you're in a high stress environment and others think that because your life is on the line you actually have almost a photographic ability to remember everything so it's hard to say but let's not lose sight of what her actual testimony was and that was that she can't or at least she said doesn't want to or isn't able to name the defendant so it's not a question of whether her recollection is accurate or not there wasn't really a recollection that ties the defendants to that incident. So in other words, what you're saying is it actually validates her in a way. Look, I, I, it's not like you, like you said, she came and said, these are the guys who did it. She said, I didn't want to come out at first and make a mistake. So I think that adds credibility to her. Is that, that's what you're saying? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, let's not lose sight of the fact that this is a death penalty case. And I'm sure that she's aware of that fact. Because she didn't say that she's not able to identify them. The testimony sounded more like she didn't want to. She didn't want to make the wrong choice. So while we can't measure what her losses were in this incident, she's still going to be hard pressed to say these people's lives should be taken when she can't be absolutely certain. What an impossible position to put her in. First testifying about the loss of her husband and also now having to decide, having to say that every word she says could sentence two other people to death. But let's learn a little bit more from Megan about what these assailants look like. Let's go back. Austin City Park. And from what direction would that person come to be coming from you, coming to you? Walking from the direction of the bar. Okay. So would he be coming like kind of straight at you? Straight at me. And that's what you noticed? That's what I noticed. Was there someone with him? There was. Okay. Do you remember what that other person looked like? Black male. 
No dreadlocks. Dark colored shirt. Do you remember anything else about his hair? It was short. Okay. And what about his height? Five nine, five ten, not average. Did you um, do you uh, have a thought about about how old this the, the second person was? Uh, late twenties, early thirties. And what about the first person in the white shirt? Mid twenties. Mid twenties. Okay. Do you want to seem or appear to be older than the other one? Yes. Which one? Uh, one with no red box. Appear to be what? Older. Older than the one in the white shirt. Yes. Sir. Do you recall if the second person had a weapon or not? Yes. Right. Tell me what you remember about that. I remember seeing a barrel pointed at Jonathan's head. Right. And you, you've gotten very soft. Sorry. How does it so speak up just a little bit and tell me what you say again. I remember seeing a barrel pointed at Jonathan's head. Okay. Do you remember what color it was? Okay. Do you remember if it was a revolver or something out of there? Revolver. The second one? Yes. Did either one of them say anything when they approached? Get me your money. And do you remember which one said that? White shark. The one with the white shark. And what happened when he approached and said that? I 